Last week we started looking at Romans chapter 6 and we looked at the first half of that and started talking about that. And if you recall, in those first 13 verses, Paul is basically addressing the audience and answering what has been presented to him in the past. You could tell that he already knows what they're thinking because he's had this asked of him several times. So he, he jumps the gun and asks the question for them, and then he begins to answer it. And the question is a very logical question, and is a very humanistic question. And basically, it goes along the lines, well, if God's grace is so much greater than any sins that we could ever commit, why not keep sinning? What's the big deal? If they're all going to be covered anyway, what difference does it make? Does sin really matter to a believer? If God's grace is going to cover them anyway. Can't we continue living the same way as we lived before we were saved? I mean, after all, God's grace has been promised to us. And Paul's response is absolutely not. And uh, depending on your translation, there's a lot of ways that was phrased. But you can understand, no matter what translation you have, it is a ridiculous answer. So he gives a reason. The first reason he gives, and we looked at this last week, why not only is this an absurd proposition, but it is an impossibility. You cannot go back and live the life that you lived before if you are a true believer. And he said, this is why. He said, because you have died to sin. You have died to sin. Now, chapter 5, he spent a lot of time and a lot of effort, and y'all were all fussing at me because we spent so long talking about this mystical union that we have with Christ and how we had this union with Adam, and all believers were transferred from this union that we have with Adam and we are placed into this union once we become believers with Christ. But something has to happen in order to go from this union to this union. Something has to happen. Well, the person that's in this union has to die and then the other person has to be born and put into this union. So we were all Every one of us were all born into Adam. And his disobedience and his sin and his condemnation and his death. Right? When you were born, it's, it's just a clock is ticking until the time that we're, you die. That's a given. And that's how you know that you were born into Adam. You say, well, maybe I wasn't. Well, are you going to die? Well, yeah. Adam. Okay, there's your evidence that you're born into it. But, once you place your faith in Christ and His redemptive atoning work on the cross, you are, as Jesus said, you must be born again. You were born the first time into Adam. You didn't get a choice. You didn't get to fill in a questionnaire, check a box. We all were. Okay? Your second birth, when you were born again, you were born into Christ must be born again. You enter in, we enter into a new union, but it's with Christ rather than Adam. So in order to be born again, you got to die first. The old you has to die. And that's what he means was that we have died to sin. The old self has died. And now you are a new person, a new self, a new creation. The Bible refers in a lot of different terminologies, but it's all new. It doesn't say you take your old self, dust it off, clean it up, and put some spit and polish on it, and that's okay. No, the old one is dead. That's why you can't go back, because the old you is dead. It's gone. As God has seen it, and, and again, we are looking at a divine principle and trying to relate it to humanity's concept and understanding, we just have to take it for what God has explained. That basically, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, God sees it as if we were literally taken back to the cross and crucified with Christ. And we died. 
And that's what the passage was talking about there. He said we are crucified. Verse 6, the first part of verse 6 says, We were crucified with Him. Were. Past tense. When was He crucified? Well, we've got the Gospels it tells us. So all believers, it's as if we are transported back and we are crucified with Him. You go, well, wait a minute, that's back in the past. Well, God doesn't have a problem with time. Christ died on the cross for all of our sins today, right? So if He can die for them going forward, it shouldn't be too hard that God reconciles us all back to the cross. So He said, we have died to our sins. We have been crucified with Him. And then since we were crucified with Him, that person is dead, that self, that man is dead, and now you're a new creation. A new self. You're, you are no longer your old self. So a true believer cannot go back to living the life that they once lived. You cannot do it. Remember, last week I gave you the example of an adult looking back at when he was like a little infant. Okay? He can't go back. He can't one day say, you know, I think I will be an infant. Now, granted, we've all acted pretty childish. But, but we didn't become an infant. And that's the difference. It's impossible. You can't do it. So once you have died to sin, and your sins were taken to the cross, and you were crucified with Christ, you can't go back. That's, that, that you is gone and dead. So that's what he's talking about. Dead to sin. You were dead to sin. Here's another thing that he says. And I like because he starts off in verse 3. He says, don't you know? Basically, there are three times in that passage that we have from verses 1 through 13. He, the word know. You should know this. You need to know this. you got to count on this. This is something you should know. And you should know it and count on it and know that it's true. And this is something you can bank on. And this should be something that you build on. There should be no doubt in your mind. Don't you know? You, I mean... You should know this. Know what? That you were baptized into Christ. You were baptized into Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it does not mean. It definitely, absolutely does not mean water baptism. It does not mean water baptism. Now, granted, water baptism or baptism of Christ gave us, it is one of the two sacraments. What's the second sacrament that Christ gave us? The Lord's Supper. He gave us two. Man's invented them. Some denominations have invented all sorts of sacraments, but the Lord only gave us the two. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some denominations believe that in order for you to be saved, you have to be baptized. That the baptism, the water baptism, is what either guarantees or makes assure or actually makes your salvation happen. That's called baptismal regeneration. And some denominations believe that's that's when you are that's when you're regenerated. That's when you are made new. When you get dunked, sprinkled, splashed, however, whatever they want to do it, when that happens, boom, that's when you're saved. But it can't mean that, can it? I mean, Paul spent three chapters explaining why the works of man can't save you. There's nothing that we can do. And if baptism does it, that means if I'm dunking somebody, then I'm the one that's providing their salvation. Right? We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. In Christ alone. Not by anything that a man can do in his own power or his own will. It just doesn't work that way. So if, if it's not talking about water baptism, we are baptized into Christ, what does it mean? Association. Ah, we are going to get into a very, I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you got stuff to write with. We are going to now enter into a very deep, theological, insightful, and profound doctrine. And it is the doctrine of the pickle principle. Some of you should remember I preached on this about nine or ten years ago. The pickle principle. 
It pertains to baptism. I'm sorry Judy isn't here as much as she likes when I talk about Greek words. There are two words in the Greek that are translated baptism. Okay? The first one is bapto. B-A-P-T-O. Bapto. And that means to dip something. Okay? Bapto. I dip something. The other one is baptizo, B-A-P-T-I-Z-O. In Greek, a lot of times, if you have a short word and then it adds some other stuff to it and it gets bigger, then the second one is more inclusive, more intensive. Okay? And so this means not only to dip something, but it means to immerse something down into something to the extent that it greatly changes it. Okay, you following me? See the difference? One is to dip it, and one is to basically put it down, soak it in, leave it in there until something happens to it. And that word baptizo is the word for baptism that's used in the New Testament. Here's the pickle principle. This will help you think about it. Old Mike in his garden, he decides to bring me a cucumber. It's in the car. So I'm going home and I look at it and say, hey, Mike could have at least washed him off a little bit. It's kind of dirty. So I'll take that cucumber, I take it home, and I rinse it and I dip it down in the water and I get all the dirt off of it and put it up on the counter and what do I have? I still got a cucumber. Because I just baptized it. I just dipped it. I just rinsed it. Okay? Ah! But, if I take that cucumber, I mix myself up a little brine, a little vinegar and water, a little salt and some other things, and I take that cucumber and I immerse it all the way down and screw that lid down and put that thing in the refrigerator and let it sit for a while. When I open up that jar, I don't have a cucumber anymore. What do I got? I have a pickle. Something happened and that pickle changed. Because it used to be a cucumber. Now, I can take that pickle out and put it on the counter. I can rinse it off. I can wave it over my head. I can do all sorts of things. But ain't nothing going to happen to make that become a cucumber again. Because it's a pickle. Because it has been immersed into and with that liquid. And the two have become one. And you can't separate them anymore. You get where I'm going? That's the pickle principle. Dipping it didn't change in it. Rinsing it didn't change in it. But immersing it made it a permanent, lasting change. And that pickle cannot go back to being a cucumber. That teaser was also used to describe when you take like a, a, a white garment and dip it in a vat of dye. And you take it out. I'm going to tell you what. Ladies, right? You can wash it all you want. It ain't going to become white anymore. It's like my shirts when Marsha's pink dress. Oh, red dress. I got pink underwear forever. <laughs> it's also used in the Greek, sometimes used for somebody who, who has a lot too much to drink, too much wine. That that liquid becomes part of them. And then they don't act like they're supposed to. And they don't act like they, I mean, they're doing crazy things and talking crazy. Or even maybe Miss Claudia with the drugs and stuff. I mean, it takes over and you become something different. And so baptizo is, when it says we are baptized into Christ, this is the picture. We're the picture. We're the cucumber. And we have been immersed into, not brine, not vinegar, but we have been immersed into Christ. We have that union with Christ. And once we're in that union with Christ, we cannot go back to the life that we had before. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So just in the same way that you died and you can't go back to being an infant, you're immersed with Christ. You've become part. The two of you are one. You're combined. And you cannot go back. cannot be a cucumber anymore. If you got your Bible, let's look at a couple of places in the New Testament. I just want to show you. 1 Corinthians 10. Back up uh, two books. Uh, four books. No. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Next book over. 
1 Corinthians 10. Paul is going to use a description uh, from the Old Testament to help us to understand. Verse, uh, chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Remember when they followed the cloud, the big pillar of cloud and fire at night and cloud and day, and they all passed through the sea. Remember when the Red Sea parted? This is what he's talking about. They were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were baptized into Moses. Now this isn't a water baptism because the only people, if you remember the story, the only people who got wet were the Egyptians. Right? They got washed away, drowned. Matter of fact, the Israelites didn't even get their feet wet. They passed on dry ground. Exactly. So this can't be referring to a water baptism. It's got to mean something else. And what he's saying here is that the Israelites, once they went through that ordeal and followed Moses and got to the other side, they were now as a nation identified with Moses. As a nation, as a people. There was no going back. They may have longed to go back so they could eat leeks and onions again. But they couldn't go back. They were now the nation of Israel, like it or not, and they were baptized into Moses. And Moses, God made them, uh, made Moses to be their leader and their spokesman. And so when that happened, when they followed him out and they left out of Egypt, they were all baptized. They were now identified with, permanently identified with Moses. There wasn't no going back. One other thing, listen. And this is one of the passages that people, when they're talking about baptism, they get it mixed up. Let me, and I'm just going to say it's the first part of Mark 16, 16. The Lord says this. Whoever, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And so those who believe in baptismal regeneration, they say, aha, the Lord says right there that you've got to believe and be baptized. So that proves that I've got to be, when I'm dunked, where I'm sprinkled, that's when I'm saved. Now, what's the word the Lord used there? Baptizo. Immersed in. So we can't be talking about water baptized. And again, because we're saved by grace alone through faith alone. It's a gift of God, the Bible tells us. Not of any act of any. So the Lord certainly wouldn't say anything contrary to the, to the whole of scriptures. Our salvation comes when, it talks about you have to believe, when we believe, that's our faith, when we receive the, 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 the saving faith, the belief in who Christ is and what He has done for us as our Savior, as our substitute, as our atonement, as our Redeemer, when we believe all of those things, that's when we are saved. But He also says, and are baptizo, immersed. Immersed in what? Him. He says you have to be immersed in me. You have to believe in me. You have to enter into, leave the Adam and enter into that union with me. So when you believe and you are in that mystic union with me, then you're saved. And that's why you can't lose your salvation. When we, as believers, are truly honest in our commitment and our devotion and our surrender to Christ as our Savior, and we are immersed into Him, in Christ. Remember, that's the phrase that's used all through the New Testament. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Bless you. That immersion into Christ will drastically change you. It has to change you. If it does not change you, you are not immersed in Christ. If you are not immersed in Christ, you are not saved. You have to, bless you again, ditto right back. You have to believe and be baptized and be immersed. 
Some people believe that Jesus is the figure in the Bible, that he's a great prophet. They can believe a lot of things that hit knowledge. But that won't save them because they're not immersed. They're not in that human... Three times a charm. Sorry. That's five. No, like five, six. I have a couple more. Okay. <laughs> Ten something. Somebody keep track, will you? Because I'm busy. <laughs> A Christian cannot go back to living the same sort of life that they lived before they were saved. They cannot do it. If they try, oh, and believe me, people try, a couple things are going to happen. One, God the Holy Spirit will make your life so miserable in your sin that He will bring you to your knees and turn you back. If you're a true believer. If you're, true, if you're immersed in Christ and you start to go too far astray, God is constantly moving us back, hurting us back, moving us back. You try to go back and live the life that you had as an old self? Yes, sir? Is that what grieving the Holy Spirit is? Yes. Yeah, grieving the Holy Spirit, that could be any sin. Okay, but do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Only a believer can grieve the Holy Spirit. True. True. And that's why when he says that, he's writing to the church. So that's a Baptist backslide. That is a believer, yeah, that is a believer um, disobeying God. <coughs> Anybody here ever disobey God since you were saved? <laughs> Bingo. Guess what? We've all grieved the Holy Spirit. Well, we really shouldn't do that. Why? Well, the Holy Spirit is going to have to do some things in our lives to help get us back on track. And a lot of times they aren't comfortable and they aren't pleasant, but they're for our purpose. Remember, the Lord chastens those who He loves. Why would He chasten us unless we <coughs> grieve the Holy Spirit? But you can't go back to the same lifestyle. I think back to some of the things that I used to do, and if I said, well, you know, I'm going to tell you what, I'm just going to do all that stuff again. Man, I had a ball doing some of that stuff. I think I'll go back and do that. Well, number one, God is, first the deacons will get me. Second, second is God will make my life so, I will have so much guilt, so much shame, so much consequences, so much grief, so much misery that I will have to turn back. I just can't do that anymore. I tried it and it ain't worth it. So either He will make your life so miserable to turn you back or he will remove you from this earth. And we have several examples in Scripture. If you remember in 1 Corinthians when Paul was writing and how they were uh, uh, abusing the Lord's Supper and, uh, and doing things like that and, 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 and Paul says, you know, the, the Lord's made some of you sick and some of you is, are, are sleeping. I mean, he's dead. And these are these are people in the church and God says, I'll just take you out. You know, if you try to live a lifestyle as a Christian that so badly reflects the character of God, because that's what you're supposed to be reflecting, if you are so horrendously um, uh, um, being an example to other Christians and to the world of what a Christian's life should be, well, God, He just just take you out. He said, I'm not going to let you do that anymore. Ananias and Sapphira, remember them? And so God certainly has that within His prerogative. He'll just take you home early. It doesn't say He'll send you to hell because if you're a true believer, but again, you can't go back. And if you try to, God has it within His disposal to either make you so miserable or just remove you from the picture. Take you out of the earthly church and bring you home. So what Paul is telling us here First, we've died to sin. We can't go back and be that old person anymore. It's just not, it, it's impossible. We can't do it. If you can do it, it means you weren't saved. You weren't immersed. So we've died to sin. We've been crucified with Christ. And we have been immersed into this permanent union with Christ. 
Jesus talked about the, you know, the vine. And without me, you can do nothing. And I and you and you and me. And Okay, this is that union. I don't understand exactly how it works because it is a divine uh, principle that my little earthly brain is trying to comprehend any more than I can figure out the divine principle of the Trinity and explain it from human viewpoint. But the Bible teaches both. So not only have we been crucified with or died to Christ, crucified with Christ, and entered into a permanent immersion into a union with Him, but He also says and we are resurrected with Him. Verse 5 says that since we have the experience in the likeness of His death, we will also experience the likeness of His resurrection. Now once again, this is not talking about we, what we immediately think it's talking about. We hear about the resurrection instantly we're thinking about when we die, we're resurrected, we go, that something is going to happen in the future. Okay? That's instantly. When I think about us and our resurrection, that's what I think about. This is not what Paul is referring to. That's not what he is speaking about. Listen, I'm going to read verse 8 through 10. We've got to be careful. There's a little passage in the middle. If you take that out all by itself, it sounds like he's talking about the future. 8 through 10 says, Nor let us... Oh, sorry. Here I go. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. talking about him being raised from the dead that resurrection that whole passage here that we've had from 5 to 10 uh, that we've been looking through talks about how we have been uh, died to sin, how we have been immersed into Christ but now it's talking about his death, now we are in the likeness of his death and if he was raised again then we raised again and that's resurrection but it's meaning more than so when it says we will also live with him we're thinking oh ooh, that's the future but it's not talking about that it's not talking about that that glorious reunion that we'll have with him uh, on the other side of the pearly gates it's talking about the new life that we have now the new life that we have now when he says it's just like Christ, and he's used Christ as the picture, he says just like Christ was living here on this earth amidst all the sin and all the death and all the work and all that he did while he was here on this earth, and then he died to sin, and he was resurrected to a new position. What Christ is now is different than what he was here on this earth. Okay? His, his work is different. He is now interceding for us at the right hand of God. So, his existence here on earth, once he was resurrected, is different than what he is today. Glorified, reunited with the Father, seated on the throne. See, it's a, it's a different thing. Things changed once he died and was resurrected to a new life. It's a new life to God. And Paul is saying that's the same thing goes for us as believers. We were under the reign of death but now we're under the reign of grace. Our position has changed forever. We can't go back to the old. Something has happened. We have died, been buried with Christ, resurrected. Ultimately there will be a future one but in the meantime we are still resurrected to a new life. We have a new work. We have a new life to live. And that's what we live each and every day. A new life and a new purpose. This describes our life as Christians today and every day. In living in a resurrected life. It means a life that we're going to live in such a way uh, that, is, uh, that holiness is attributed to us here on this earth. A different life than what we had before. 
That's why Paul in uh, Philippians 3.10, he said, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. He wasn't talking about getting to heaven. He was talking about the power of Christ in His life, the resurrection life, so that He can live a holy life that honors God. That He can live each and every day in Christ in such a way that His life would be meaningful and honoring of God. Does that make sense? So Paul's answer is, well, why don't we just keep on sinning since God's got all that extra grace and He's, gonna, he's promised to cover all of our sins? Why not? Well, first of all, you've died to sin. You're no longer the person that you used to be. And you can't go back. And you have been baptized. You have been immersed into Christ. You can't change back. He's changed you into something completely different. You can't go back. And you've been raised resurrected to a new life, a holy life. Different than what you used to live. And guess what? You can't go back. You can't be unresurrected. We've been saved by God's grace. And we as believers have all died to sin. And now we have been made alive to God. Made alive to God. That's the purpose and the reality of who we are. And folks, I'm going to tell you, that's something we should meditate on every day. I'm not done. Almost done. Somebody does something that makes you mad. Uh, if I get hold of it. I'm going to do this back. I'm going to do that. Gonna, uh, you start thinking about this, and all of a sudden, hit the brakes and go, wait a minute. That's not who I am. That's not how I'm supposed to behave. The old me might have taken joy. Wait a minute. That's not me. I don't have to do that. And you can approach life with a different mindset. When you're tempted to be greedy or selfish or whatever else, maybe in anger to control your emotion, whatever it is, hit the brakes and go, wait a minute. That's not who I am. I'm a new creation. God has made me new. I've been resurrected to a new life. I don't have to act that way. It's not me. See how that can affect everything that we do? Yeah, I'm really tired today. I don't think I'm going to do my Bible reading. Wait a minute. God resurrected me to a new life. What's part of my new life? To study Him and study His Word. And do... Wait a minute. That's who I'm created to be. And it gives joy and purpose while we're waiting for the next resurrection. Paul wants us to... That's why he keeps saying, don't you know? You should know. This is something you need to know. And you need to count on these things because they're absolute truth and fact and the foundation of your Christian life. God created each of us as a new creation, immersed in Jesus Christ, as a new creation to live a resurrected life here on this earth and for all eternity in such a way that we bring honor and glory to Him each day. And that's what Paul says. That's why you can't keep on sinning like you used to. That's the answer to the question. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah it makes sense. Y'all did good on the pickle principle. <laughs> any questions? About any other vegetables? <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Lord God, when we think about all that happened, that, that moment when we gave our lives to You, when we trusted Christ for an eternal life, when we surrendered our lives to Him, gave Him our old, diseased, and condemned life for a new, blessed, and eternal one. Lord, that very instant when that happened, we died to sin. We died to that old man, that old person that we were. And Lord, we are immediately immersed into Christ, into everything that He is, 
in everything that he does and blend it into him that we are permanently and drastically changed from who we were. And in that instant in time too, we were resurrected into a new life, a different life, a life that honors you and brings glory to your name. Lord, we thank you for that transaction that happened so quick. But Lord, help us to meditate on that and to remember that when our days become difficult and temptations swirl around us, that we don't have to act like the world and how we did before. In fact, you have made us and created us in such a way that we can't do it even if we tried. Though sadly we do. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the blessing of your word. Keep us safe as we travel home from this place. We lift up our prayer and praise and thanksgiving of our Lord and God.